Living. Welcome to the healing meditation. And as you feel comfortable, sit back, relax, and let as much go as you can. Take a deep breath. And what I'll do is do the reading and then go right into the meditation. So if you feel comfortable, let your eyelids close and just breathe in, breathe out, get into a rhythmic sense of that inflow and exhale, breathing in the nourishment and letting go of that which no longer serves me. The reading this morning from Science of Mind magazine, Thursday for June 1st, even though we're a little farther into the month than that. The title is Going Out of My Head. <laughs> oh, joy. God is calling. <laughs> it's all good. So going in and out of my head, over you, out of my head, over you, out of my head, day and night, night and day and night. Little Anthony and the Imperials going out of my head. You may pick that song up in your mind from times and days ago. Our body is not only separate, is not separate from the infinite intelligence that created it. Our body is not separate from the infinite intelligence that created it. And so our author writes that, as a child, I relished the times when I could pull out my favorite 45, put in a tiny record player and let it blare through the playroom walls. As the song by the little Anthony, little Anthony and the Imperials going out of my head played, I would run back and forth across the room and throw myself into the pillows on the couches on the other side. I sometimes played the song three or four times, even at five years old, I was exhausted. I love the feeling of moving my body and the exhilaration of the sweat and rapid pulse. And now, almost 60 years later, I must remind myself to get out of my head and revel in the movement and the moving of my body. There is a freedom in my body and I often cannot access it in my mind. Our teacher teaching re relies heavily on our relationship to mind, consciousness, and thought and to live a joyful life. I have found that my body needs my care, my attention, and my respect. As Ernest Holmes reminds us, our bodies are one with infinite intelligence and are included in our spiritual practices. I love to remind myself of those first words in an often repeated prayer and affirmation. I live and move and have my being in God. As a student of science of mind, we would do well to get out of our heads and into our bodies through movement. Today I move and relish the gift of my body and let my mind rest. It is safe to get out of my head. And as we go forward into this meditation, just know this truth with me now, that there is one mind, one body, one God, one ever-knowing presence everywhere that I can imagine it is. And it is a part of me now, and I am a part of it. Even if I, I recognize this, I know that I have a power within me that can heal myself and others. But I focus in on this spiritual being within, right here and right now. I recognize my physical body as that wonderful vessel that gets me from here to there. It gets me all of my senses. I allow my mind to relax and let go. And I cherish and give thanks 
for this wonderful vessel that is me. I can sense a feeling at the tip of my toes and I allow myself to come up through my legs, my knees, through my thighs, and I just relax. I let it go. I let any feeling within this area of my body just flow out through the ends of my toes, releasing and letting go, and remaining firmly planted on the ground and in my chair. As I get into my torso, my abdomen, I feel this wonderful feeling throughout my abdomen, moving up my body into my heart, knowing that as I feel this beat, I know that the divine flow is rushing through my body take that oxygen to every area within my body that it can go. I revel in the thought of this. And as it comes back, it comes back to, re to breathe out anything less than what is needed. It's the cycle. And so I cherish and honor my heart now, letting it do, letting it do what it does best, pump away. And as I feel this energy coming up through the center of my being, I can allow my shoulders to pull back as I sit taller in my chair. I can feel that I'm open in all of my chakras. And I allow this circulation to continue to flow as I get to my neck and into my head. I can allow the energy to continue to grow and expand. I am radiating out the joy and love of this day, of my heart, of my body, much the way the sun radiates out light and heat. sense a wonderful joy within this vessel. Wonderful opportunity to sense how it all goes together and works in unison for my greatest good. I take a moment now in silence to sit in the bask of this moment, radiating energy out becoming a part of the flow within my body for my great energy. And I take this moment now. I can sense that I'm connected to the floor and to the ground, to the earth. And yet as I allow myself to expand and stretch my body, I can feel it grow tall and expand, extend into the sky, radiating out a light at both ends of the body. 
and all around you. I feel an energy field of joy and love that surrounds me. I sense it, I know it, and I expect it to be there. This is what reaches out and greets others today. The joy of my being, the love in my heart, the healthiness in this vessel that guides each step of my day, joyful and loving, creative and expansive. New ideas flood through my body, through my mind, and through my spirit. And I allow myself, with the ringing of the bell, to joy, to be in a joyful place, an even greater expansiveness within my mind and body and spirit. As I go forward this day, I do so with purpose, with joy, and with love in my heart. Stepping into the greater expanse of my spiritual journey. I give thanks for this time this morning to center our thoughts, our ideas, to allow this body to grow in mind in spirit and move forward with joy in our day today. I accept it to be so and together we say and so it is. Flowing out like a river, God's love flowing out to me. Yeah, flowing out like a river, God's love flowing out to me. Flowing out like a river, God's love flowing out to me. Flowing out like a river, God's love flowing out to me like a rain. Sunshine, God's love flowing out to me like a bright rays of sunshine. God's love flowing out to me, bright rays of sunshine. God's love flowing out to me, bright rays of sunshine. God's love flowing out to me, flowing out like a river. My love shining bright, flowing out like a river. My love shining bright, flowing out like a river. My love shining bright, flowing out like a river. My love shining bright. I wake up, stay with a smile. Back home, take me back home. 
gossip flows like a river washing down on me flow like a river yeah guys love flowing out to me flowing out like a river guys love flowing out to me flowing out like a river
for God to wake up, wake up. I'm feeling I forgot. Oh. on that one so if you if you know it sing along but we're going to teach you a part so why do we sing singing vibrates the whole body so no matter what happens every single cell in your body is touched by the vibration through your voice right so if you want to play with that and sing a good vibration if you set an intention with the sound that actually lifts your vibration so this song is called ordinary day and it is about a day that looks ordinary but that you can turn into extraordinary so if you want to visualize something like that the sound the words are oh 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 we try to make them easy to remember you know it doesn't have to sound like anything but feeling good Inside, so I pause through my gaze to the sky. Along with 
your head to the ground. Somewhere to be, no time to look around. People yelling, trucks roaring, overwhelmed sound. Plugging in your headphones just to dim it down with the radio on and the radio up. You know we're singing loud because we never give up. I've been living in the past, thing for way too long. Time to slow it down, might be time to move on. Cause I know there's so much more to a life than this. Remembering to give thanks each day we're blessed. And how can you make extraordinary things from an ordinary day? Stay. Maybe now it's time to fly on this ordinary day. you guys we're Sam and Lucy if you haven't met us come say hi we are now introducing the one the only drum roll Reverend Dr. Ken Wilcox <laughs> <laughs> thank you Sam and Lucy I like when they throw that doctor part on that is, that's the thank you guys oh yeah I'm waiting to get the prescription pad the somehow that's been held up Welcome, everyone. My name is Reverend Ken Wilcox. This is Sam and Lucy behind me. Wow, they're great music. They'll be playing more for you. They have a workshop this afternoon if you want to come, 4.30, and it'll be an amazing event, so be sure to come for that. You know, all life asks, all it requires from us, one thing, one thing alone. That's the opportunity to appear. You're that opportunity, and so am I. It's the purpose of this wonderful teaching of ours to keep us reminded of this truth in our lives and to help this truth, to help this power, to help this love, kindness, and compassion show up in your life in a larger, stronger, more dynamic way. I always ask you to do one simple thing each Sunday morning, and that is to leave all your troubles, your fears, your would-haves, your could-haves, your should-haves, to leave all that stuff outside and the next 45 minutes or so to open up an avenue of spirit possibilities. And what are spirit possibilities? Well, they're for more love, more joy, more kindness, more compassion, more friendship, all those things in life that make us feel alive. 
Because that's what spirit is doing through you, it's doing through me, showing up in the physical, recognizing itself through our love, our joy, and our laughter. So know you're in a great place this morning. And if you will do that one thing, just release your fears, release your worries, release your doubts just for a moment, spirit will awe you with how the blessings it can rain down upon you. Well, just a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, we do have our picnic today. Uh, please come. You don't have to have signed up. We, we will have enough food for everybody. Directions to it are outside. It's at the um, Shores Pavilion Club, a river club. That's what that's called, Riverview. It's easy to get to their directions outside. Uh, let's see, Sam and Lucy this afternoon, uh, workshop at 4.30. Next week, we're going to start a raffle. We have a whole collection of, of goodies, gift cards, and other things uh, for about $300, and we're going to start that raffle. We hope to, to, to get about $1,000, so uh, be on the outlook for all of that. Well, those are all my announcements, and I know Sam and Lucy have got something great for us. Guys? Mm -hmm. So this is open. Open yourself and just receive. Very nice, guys. Very nice. So now we want to get our service uh, started, and in doing so, we've got Richard Austin doing the reading and treatment for us. Come on up, Richard. Thank you. Awesome, you guys. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day. All right, great. All right, well, never mind. Uh, the reading this morning is uh, Father's Day Your Way. Don't go and talk about my father, because God is my friend. Jesus is my friend. He made this world uh, for us to live in and gave us everything. And all he asks of us is, I know, is that we give each other love. Marvin Gaye, God is my friend. Your endeavor, then, is not so much to find God as it is to realize that presence within us and to understand that presence is with us always and it is always with you. Ernest Holmes, this thing called you. All right, so going on for Dad's Day here. Uh, holidays and, uh, are, and observances differ for many of us because of our histories, our culture, our religion, and our non-religious beliefs, and our state of mind. Some folks find no meaning in any holidays or observances, and some a specific few. Some look forward to every reason to celebrate, and some are awash in awash and longing over old memories or that uh, still reside in, protect, in a protected place within all of us. Obviously, every one of us here had a father um, and a mother. But uh, anyway, when I was growing up, uh, I never had my mom come to me and say, don't you dare forget about your Father's Day. 
However, Dad did a great job of reminding us that Mother's Day is not one to miss. And there was one Mother's Day when all of us, uh, my, I have four, three brothers, there's four of us, and uh, we missed Mother's Day. But only until noon, because Dad was there. <coughs> Our author writes, uh, I lived some of my life without father figure and all my life without a generic father, genetic father, excuse me, not generic, a genetic father. I chose to celebrate Father's Day by being thankful that my, absence, uh, my absent father created a longing within me that led to my rich spiritual life. Whatever this day means to you, it's, it has value and possibility. If it call it if it calls for love, laughter, and celebration, allow that to be. If it calls for tears and reflection, let that be. This is the richness of our human experience. And so one more story I was there. As a remembrance, as a little boy, I used to walk in, and my dad, back in the day, uh, used a straight razor. And to sharpen that razor, there was a long leather strap that was taller than I was. I remember that and watching him go up and down with a straight razor, and then I'd watch him shave, try not to cut himself. And that <laughs> wasn't all that he used that uh, straight, uh, that strap for. Fortunately, it was mostly on my brothers. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, so no, <laughs> no as, as we get through that story, and you can picture in your mind what that might look like, uh, Take a deep breath and just relax and sit back in your chair and let the chair support you. And know this one truth with me now. That there is a divine, universal power and presence within me, all around me, and everywhere I can imagine, and even further. That I align myself with this presence, and I reflect on it, I see it, I sense it, I know it is me. And as I connect with this divine spirit, I know that I consciously and subconsciously align myself with it to become that greatest spiritual person that I can be today and always. I know that my health is absolutely a part of this day. My bright and joyful spirit is absolutely a part of this day. And my smile to others extends my love to others in every way possible. And I see that for each and every one of us. As we go further into this day, we know that the divine spirit leads us and allows us to be on our spiritual pathway with joy and with love. I give thanks for this, this knowing, this presence, this day. One more deep breath we release and let it go together by saying, and so it is. Thank you, Richard. I had a dream. We were in an unfamiliar place. All of the ground beneath was torn, the memory erased. Right from my heart, sounded out a prayer. It's all 
That was great, Sam and Lucy. Thank you, guys. That was really nice. Well, my uh, talk title today is The Mysteries of Life. The Mysteries of Life. You know, there's just some things about life you can't explain. And uh, what did William Shakespeare said? There are more things, Horatio, in heaven and earth than your philosophies have dreamt of. Um, and Shakespeare himself is a mystery to think that one person produced all this, all this material it's, it's, it's unimaginable. Uh, so they, there is a mystery of life, and we're supposed to, life is supposed to be uh, have some mystery. If you have everything figured out in life, you're, A, deceiving yourself, and B, you want to have goals in life that are going to require spirit to step in and help you along the way because the, the whole goal of life is not to get the corner office. It's not to get the relationship. It's not to get the car. The goal of life is to be in partnership with your good, with God, to know that you have this partnership, that you've helped bring about a, a greater good, to help bring about, to make the world a better place for your having been in it. So today I'm going to be talking about some mysteries, both ancient, uh, more recent ones, and current events that just defy explanation. There are a lot of mysteries in our, our, our ancient history. One of the things that's very curious right now, the archaeologi archaeological studies are telling us, is things are much older than we had pre conceived of before. They're pushing uh, human uh, intellect and intelligence further and further back. Uh, of course, one that I know everybody has studied is the pyramids and the sphinx of uh, the Great Pyramids. Uh, the sphinx itself is really... One is as interesting as the pyramid uh, behind it. It's actually a lot older than the pyramids. Uh, and they believe it's much, much older than the pyramids because you can kind of tell along the sandstone around it there are signs of a water erosion. Well, do you, do you see, see any water around <laughs> the, the present, present place? It had to be a long, long, long time ago that that environment had been a uh, place that was receiving rainfall. It was a long time ago. Also, you can tell the head of the Sphinx itself has been recarved because it's not in proportion to the body. And the one thing the Egyptians did not have trouble with was getting things in proportion. Because that's one of the miracles of the pyramid itself is how they were able to build that thing and have it so exact that it didn't collapse. Now, we don't really know how they built the pyramid. When I was growing up, they told us it was slave labor that did it. We now know that that is not true. Well, we also don't really know why they built it. 
the, the first the explanations we were told as kids is they were burial grounds. Nothing, nothing has ever been found in them to lead us to believe that, 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 that they ever were a tomb. And to me, one of the, the biggest kind of curiosities is that when you open up other Egyptian tombs, uh, one of the things that you're going to find as you go into the burial chambers is they're going to be covered, covered in murals because the, the people who were in there needed directions on how to move through the, the afterlife. There's none of that, none of that in the pyramids. So why not? There are also things that they, we, uh, when I, we were in school, they called air shafts. Uh, that lead for the inner chamber of the pyramids and go for an extended uh, 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 distance. The explanation was these things were air shafts. Well, the only problem with that is they don't go outside. They don't get to the air. <laughs> so they can be air shafts. And you can only imagine the difficulty it was creating these open spaces, dealing with these hundreds of tons of rock that they were carving out. And for what purpose? We now have robot, robotic uh, equipment that can go through the air shafts. What they find out is they get to little spaces that are aligned with precious metal. But that's it. And so why did they, they spend that much energy, that much time, that much capital for what purpose? My assumption is, is they, they had to be doing it. The, uh, to do something that was of service to them. I think it's a big mistake to think of people who live previous to us as not as intelligent as we are. They, didn't ha they don't have the information we have, but it doesn't mean that they were dumb, and it doesn't mean that they would work and spend a lot of capital on something that didn't have a return. Now, the most modern, one of the most brilliant thinkers of the last century, a guy named Nikola Tesla, he thought it was somehow producing energy. He thought that was the goal of it. I don't know. He also had a 12-year relationship with a white pigeon that he called his wife. So take that for what you want. Now, it's actually, uh, it's actually very interesting. He, had, he, couldn't, he was basically so brilliant, he had trouble interacting with other people. This relationship with this white pigeon that was wild for 12 years, and he said the day she died, she came to his, he stayed in the hotel, she came to the hotel room, he said light uh, came from her body, and then she was gone. Who knows? Who knows? Another, another mystery. Now, if you're talking about ancient sites, to me, the most fascinating and unexplained one right now is a site called, uh, let me get this right, Puma Punka. Puma Punka. It is from uh, Bolivia. There you go. Nothing really much to, uh, to see. It was, doesn't look like anything beautiful, but it looks to me like they're modular building blocks, as that's what this is. These blocks weigh hundreds of tons hundreds of tons. They're from solid stone. We don't even have the machinery now to move them. Uh, 600 BC, uh, they are, the stones themselves show absolutely no chiseling marks, none. Uh, and they were designed so that they could interlock, come, come together, together, really, really like, like modular, modular housing uh, we, we do today. today. Uh, uh, and, and the, because, because of the, the interlocking, interlocking features, there's, there's almost no way we could even do that now with stone. We'd, we'd have, have difficulty now. There are no chisel marks on them, no driz drilling marks on them, although they're covered in little tiny holes. When you, they're also, they have magnetic energy to them. And when you get, take a magnetic reader and you get to the places where the stones have been worked, the meter goes off the charts. They become very magnetic at certain points. Now, they're made out of stone, and they've analyzed the stone. There's organic material in the stone. They say it's, it's similar to rubber. Stones don't have organic material. They don't have that. So where do these stones come from? How do they manipulate them? And 
uh, it's begin, people are theorizing, it looks as almost they were poured. It looks like it was like the form they had, and somehow stone was poured into these uh, forms. We don't know how to do that. <laughs> you chisel stone. You don't pour it. Here's the other fascinating thing about uh, uh, this site. We don't, all the stones have been moved. We don't know what it looked like. We don't know really what, what the, the, the outlay was. But something cataclysmic happened, incredibly strong, that blew the place up and hurled these stones hundreds of tons and scattered them all over. How that happened, we don't know. But it's fascinating to think about. Now, moving a little bit forward and talking more about metaphysics, I will uh, mention two stories from, I hate to admit it, I, I, I know it's just going to stay between the two of us. I know it won't go any further. There was a silly, silly little program used to come on TV. Silly, oh, silly, Unsolved Mysteries. I never missed an episode. I was there for every one. The host was Robert Stack. This is just a little, little side piece of information. If you're ever on uh, Jeopardy, this might be one of the clues. Uh, uh, Robert Stack got his start from Joan Crawford. She spotted him as a good-looking guy, talented actor, and that's how he got going. And he was the host of this series. And I think that's actually selling a, uh, a uh, Robert Stack action figure. I wasn't that bad. I will tell you that. I never had the Robert Stack action figure. But they would tell these really interesting stories that couldn't be explained. One was about a Methodist church in Nebraska. I have an affiliation for Nebraska. I one time ran a a political, can a congressional campaign for in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, so uh, people from Nebraska are lovely, sweet, open, kind. It's a great place. So this happened in the early 50s. It was a small Methodist church. Uh, they had a choir of maybe like 15 people. They practiced on Wednesdays uh, at 6 o'clock. The people of the choir, says the choir director, uh, the, the, she was a lovely person, but she had one rule, one rule. You have to be on time. At 6 o'clock, you've got to be there to practice on Wednesday night. And they said, everybody worked with her, said that they all knew this about her. This particular Wednesday night, it was in February, dark, cold. Nebraska could be very cold. Uh, the maintenance work of the church had gone in and turned on a space heater of the church. You remember those gas space heaters? But he didn't ignite it. He turned it on and didn't, and didn't light it. So it was pumping natural gas into this building. Now they said for all the, the, the choir, all the choir, and to every single one of them, something happened. The choir director on her way, she got a flat tire. One of the main singers, her uh, dad got sick, was in the hospital. She had to run to the hospital. Another one came down with flu, didn't want to come. They interviewed a, a young girl. She had been a high school student at the time. And she said that, um, you know, it was winter in Nebraska, got, got dark earlier. She said she'd gotten home from high school. Her mom, they had dinner, dinner at five. She, she said, said after dinner, she was just so exhausted. exhausted. She, she says, she, I, I sat down, and she said, I just did not have the energy to get up out of that seat. And she, she said, before she knew it, 30 minutes had passed. So another odd thing, uh, several of them converged on the church at the same time. It was like four or five of them pulled up at the church, all late, all at the same time. And as they were getting ready to go into the building, it completely exploded. They would have all been dead if they had been in the building. But something happened. Something wanted them to live, and they all lived. Another uh, curious story that I find really fascinating is uh, about a pen name. You can look this up. The pen name is Patience Worth. It's a pen name from a, a lady who lived, I think, in Indiana, the turn of the century. Uh, here she is, Pearl Current. Pearl did not think herself attractive. She was a middle-class housewife. Um, 
she had just barely graduated from high school. She didn't really have a lot of intellectual curiosity. They said that she had a hard time um, uh, getting through books. She just had the attention span. But she was a lovely person. She and a couple of her friends began to play around with a Ouija board. Do not. <laughs> Don't do that. I'll talk about that at some later uh, uh, talk. But they began to play, and that was a common thing at the turn of the century. That was, that was a common power game. They began to play around with this Ouija board. They got in touch with this spirit, uh, and that's what you want to avoid. They got in touch with this energy. Well, because see, really lovely, sweet, and smart you know, people in the physical pass over to the spirit. Also, dumb and mean people pass over. So you just don't know who you're going to get. Best to leave it alone. Uh, but they got a good one. And it was this female energy. And she said that she had lived uh, way back in England. And uh, at first, she communicated through the Ouija board. Then she got to with Pearl, that Pearl could actually hear her voice and communicate intellectually. She didn't need the Ouija board anymore. Together, they wrote many poems and many, many other things. But they, uh, they wrote a book, and it's called The Sorry Tale. The Sorry Tale. It was a bestseller at the time. The New York Times said it's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. It is almost unreadable because it's written in um, stream of consciousness. So, so it's just re it's written as as it had been experienced. It wasn't written for a reader. And so, when a character comes in, they don't give you the backstory. They don't you know they don't really tell you anything about it. They just allow the the new character to come in and start talking. So it's very difficult to 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 figure out exactly what's going on. And it's a story about a Roman soldier who's involved with the crucifixion of Christ. Now, here's the amazing thing. This woman had never writ written anything at all. She wasn't a scholar. She wasn't a student. Scholars say it's pretty much historically accurate. How did it happen? How did that come up? And so we just don't know. Now, in our present life, there's a mystery going on that the military, the military is reporting to Congress that's pretty fascinating. The military is going to Congress in front of congressional hearings and are saying, we are seeing things, we are experiencing things that we don't have an explanation for. And that is UFOs. They are seeing these round objects that can track our fi fastest fighter jets, that can track them and that can also turn on a dime and head in another direction. We, our technology, we can't, we can't make those maneuvers. Even if you can make those maneuvers, the G-forces that would be generated with those maneuvers would just cause anything we have just to break up. Here's the other thing about them, is that when they turn and make these accelerations, they're accelerating at rates that we cannot fathom, they're producing no jet stream. When we are, our jets or any cars or something, when we use any energy to uh, fuel, to, you know, to move something along, there is a natural jet stream that comes from the burning of that fuel. That's the way all of our mechanisms work. These things don't work that way. They're turning, they're making uh, you know, uh, moves, no jet stream. So we have no explanation of how this is ha happening. The military is reporting to Congress, and still, it's still up for mysteries. Of course, people want to say, well, that is aliens showing up. Uh, I kind of agree with my teacher, Kennedy Schultz. He always said the best proof that there's intelligence in the universe is that none of us tried to contact us. That, that, that may be just about right. Now, our teaching, our teaching, we open, our, we open ourselves up to mystery. There is mystery to life. One of the ways we call, talk about mysteries is with synchronicities. This was first talked about uh, with Carl Jung. 
He was a, a, a student of Sigmund Freud, uh, a disciple. He was in the Freud uh, uh, school of thought. Freud kicked him out. Sigmund Freud was a very difficult person to go along with. You had to agree with everything that he said. Uh, Carl Jung was too expansive of a thinker to, um, to do that. He came up with the notions of archetypes. He came up with uh, a notion he called the collective unconscious. Um, we have a very similar kind of idea. We call it race, race consciousness. It's basically where everybody just kind of agree on something. And he had this idea of synchronicity, where two events can happen uh, randomly that point towards a larger pattern. Two kind of random kind of things happening that point towards uh, a larger pattern. And this has been showing up for me, particularly in the last month or so, and I'll, I'll explain. Now, I know uh, many of you got my email that my dear little Sadie, my angel on four paws, that she transitioned this past Thursday. And it was, it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do to make that decision that it was time to, to release her. Um, and, you know, I know people who have a really firm belief in the universe and know really deeply that we're governed by laws of love and, and, and that life is eternal, that they can probably walk through these challenges with poise and dignity. And then I know there are others of us that when we go through such challenges, we act like a mix of Betty Davis and Donald Duck. I can guess you know which option I, I, I took, yeah. And I don't apologize for any of it. I really, I really don't. I am very grateful that I had many friends, many friends and family reach out and comfort me. And it's interesting that I, I needed that, that, that comfort. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I knew I was kind of on a, in a, and I knew the boat was kind of going under a little bit. I reached out to a spiritual counselor I was paying a lot of money for and because I, I was feeling like I needed some help and advice. And I was telling him uh, 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 about Sadie. And um, I kind of had to pull away from him because one of the things he told me, he says, well, you know, Ken, as a channel of God, you can keep Sadie as alive as long as you want to. I was like, well, what the dickens? Where did, when, you know, where did that, who, who, why didn't I learn that? And I don't, but I don't believe it. I don't believe it. He may can. I don't know if I have that kind of faith. And for me, life has seasons. My experience with Sadie had seasons. There were seasons of her as a puppy. There were seasons of her as a young adult, the ad adult. And then there was a season of her being the older dog, which I was doing everything in my power to make sure was as comfortable as possible and that she kept, she would keep eating. I mean, I fed her pork roast, gave her a meatloaf from Publix. Uh, uh, there was a long time chicken fingers from uh, Publix. The fresh ones, mind you, not the ones you got in the little case. She could, she could tell the difference. And... I was telling him this, and he, he spoke up and said, he said, gosh, if you just think about, she's, she's staying, staying alive, and you're feeding her a greasy fried, fried chicken, you know, how, how she, she could, could do really good, good if you gave her some other stuff. stuff. And I, I thought, thought to myself, myself, you know what? You can badmouth me. You can badmouth my pet, you know, care. You are not going to badmouth the good people at a public grocery store that fries that chicken. I'm just not going to put up with it now. No. So, so I, I cut, cut him off. I cut, cut him off. It was friendly nice. nice. I, I got, got some good stuff from him, but I wanted, wanted to move on. on. Now, here's the interesting thing that happened. Here's the interesting thing. Both my sisters, Reba and Sandra, uh, Reba, the beauty queen who used to shoot at ex-husbands, uh, Sandra, the comedian, oh, gosh, she was, she was so funny. Both of them have transitioned. It's been three and five years now. And early on, early on when they went, there'd be moments when I'd think to myself, I'm going to give Reba a call. You know, I'm going to give Sandra. So I said, well, there's no calling them. And for about the last month and a half, because they were both 
dog lovers, I've had that experience again. And it's been a long, long time since I've had that, that, that experience. But the last month or two, I've had it just a flash. Uh, you, know, I'll, you know, I'll give Reba a call. Now, here's the funny thing. About a month ago, I had to go to a wedding. So I had to dig out uh, a suit from the, the back of the closet. And you, I don't wear suits very often. And so it had been a long, long time since I had um, worn a suit. And I was going through them because they're all different sizes and stuff. And finally, I found the one that was the right, the right one. And I could feel something was, was in one of the side pockets. And I reached in and pulled it out. And what was it? It was the memorial card from Reba's funeral that had been, you know, three years ago. And it had been in that jacket. I don't even remember getting that memorial card. Later on, last week, actually on Monday, I was going to clean up my car, and I uh, was cleaning out the trunk, and there were some books in it that I had were, was going to take to, uh, uh, to Goodwill, and there were books that had been left over from the, my office when I cleaned out my office, and it was just two of them, and as I was moving them around, something in my head said, that book's special. That book special. And it was a book about siblings. I didn't remember where it came from. Kind of like a picture book. It's not necessarily a book that I would have picked out for myself. I didn't, you know, I, I, it didn't resonate with me. But something in my head said, that book's special. And when I thought that, I opened the book up. And there, it was from Sandra, my sister. And she had signed the book and written a letter and evidently, I had been going through a tough time at that time because she had sent me a check. In our family, when people send you money, they're really worried about you. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a sign. And it was like, you know, reach out to these two energies. These two, in their own way, have let me know that they're still in my life. Because it had been years since I had gotten a uh, check for that suit didn't remember anything about. There is this power in the universe. And Dr. Holmes says, if you call it dust, it's dust. If you say it's coincidence, it's coincidence. He said, if you call it God, it is God. If you call it good, it is good. If you call it power, it is power to you. It is, it is what do they call them, God wings. It's the universe telling you you're, you're on the right path. Keep doing what you're doing. There's a power and love and a goodness that there is with you and is supporting you and helping you along your way. Dr. Holmes, the founder of our teaching, he says that uh, what we are looking for, we are looking with. And we're here to know that there is a power of goodness flowing through our lives, and we can use that power to make the world a better place. He says there's a peace at the center of your being, a peace that can be felt throughout the day in the cool of the evening when you've released your labors and the first star shines. He says the soft light of the sky, it brews over the earth quietly, tending our hearts and cares like a mother watches over her child. You are not here alone. You're not on this journey alone. He said, identify yourself with this abundant life. He said, think of those things which bring you peace. Dwell on the unity of goodness, love, and joy. Position yourself in the realization that you live in pure spirit. And when you do, you're going to find that you have help in this life. You're going to have powers born to you, and you will find yourself renewed by divine life, led by divine intelligence, and guarded by divine love. It's what we've come here to do, and we can do it. It's this power within us that's never been disappointed in you for one moment, never rejected you for any of your mistakes, has always been more awed and inspired by your possibilities to bring hope and love, compassion and kindness and goodness to this world. You are on a mission from God, and Spirit is well pleased with you. It's urging you on to be the best you can be. 
This is the truth in your life this morning. It's the truth in mine, and so it is. <laughs> oh, I was down, head bent in sorrow. I felt my dreams scattered around. I took a walk down by the river in hopes of finding solid ground. When I looked up into the sunlight that streamed in colors through the sky, I felt the door of my heart open as God's light met my inside. Cause I've got the light, the light inside. This little light still burning bright with all I've been through. My life still shines through this little light of my inside. Well, I took a walk to meet the neighbors with my light still burning bright they talk of sorrow troubles and heartache going well into the night when I speak aloud about the light inside of me and how they all have their own light burning bright for all to see cause I've got the light this little light still burning bright with all I've been through the light still shines through this little light of mine inside one night I woke one night I woke up in a tremble in a tremble I had a dream I had a dream that I had died that I had died there was an angel there was an angel who stood before me who stood before me Showed me the moments, showed the moments of, my of my life, all the good times and the hard ones. Some I laughed and some I cried. Oh, if only I could wake up and give my life another try. Light of mine. The light of mine. 
shine inside. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light, this little light still burning bright. I'm gonna let it shine. With all I've been through, my light still shines true. This little light, let it shine. Let it shine. Thank you, Sam and Lucy. All right, so now we come to the time we support this center, and we support this center because this is a great, amazing place doing great good. Your support is helping us keep this light and vision and beacon of love going strong. Now, you can support us in several ways. One, you can support us in prayer work, praying, seeing this auditorium full as it once was before COVID, uh, praying, seeing all our good efforts, getting, getting out there in the world and making a difference. You can also uh, volunteer for us. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff we need help with so that you can do that, and you can support us in coin. However you choose to do so, know that your blessings will return to you, and take your intentions and place it over your heart and read with me this affirmation of prosperity. I live in a universe of abundance as I freely and joyfully give. I join in the divine flow, and all I share with life returns to me multiplied abundantly. And so it is. If the ushers have stepped down, Sam and Lucy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Y'all want to add that percussion again? It was nice. Yeah, y'all are hired as the band. <laughs> Look at what we've done. Together we are strong and we will carry on. Tell me what you see, the truth of you and me. We can look into our hearts and see the love we bring. Love is all we are. Let's get together. Let's be together. We Let's be together. This love for one another, I feel it getting stronger. And we don't have to feel divided any longer. Even if I just met you today, I feel our connection in a deeper way. Together, when we come together, 
Let's be together. <laughs> Thank you, Sam and Lucy. Thank you, Barb. Thank you for your support. Your support is allowing us to grow and to continue to be a beacon of love and hope and light and kindness to a world, and the world needs all of that it can get right now. So you're doing good and purposeful work, and it's going to return to you in ways you cannot even, just in your most wild imagination, know that God is supporting you. This is our truth. We celebrate it, rejoice in it, and together in consciousness we say, and so it is. All right, so we'll conclude our service with an affirmative prayer. I'm going to do it in the first person. Take it in for yourself. If I say something that works for you, hold tight to that. If I say something that doesn't work for you, just let that part slide by. But just know this truth with me this morning. There's but one God and one mind and one power. That power is perfect love, divine health, uh, perfect wisdom and intelligence. It created me from itself plus nothing else. So here now, I walk the soil of St. Augustine uh, as a channel of God's love, compassion, and kindness. And there is no shadows, no turmoils, no confusion. I see out in the world stronger than the love of God. There is no division that cannot be uh, covered with the kindness and compassion of spirit. So here today, I know something better for myself. I choose to think of myself as spirit thinks of me. Not as weak, not as wounded, but boldly compassionate, dynamically loving, here to help the world evolve into a, a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, where love and kindness flow like waters from the fountain where sisterhood and brotherhood reign over all, where everyone's respected, where everyone's uh, honored as a child of God. I am here to witness the love and kindness of compassion rain down upon us and renew heaven and earth, bloom and blossom a, a, a garden of Eden here and now in this moment. This is what I've come to do. Spirit is calling me forth. It has made a path before me, and I am not turning back. I am not holding my soul hostage to fear and doubts. I've done it too long. This morning, I am lifting my eyes up to a new knowing for myself that I am the love of God made manifest, manifest and that my heart and soul are bursting forth and shining bright. I am bringing the light of God's love to this world. This is my truth. Every cell of my being radiates this right knowing, and I release this prayer in the mind of God. Do us good and perfect, bold and dynamic work, returning to us multiplied abundantly. And together we say, and so it is. All right, my friends, I'm going to leave you with one last thought, and that is your life. Your life, it's not a problem to be solved. It's miracle unfolding. Your job this week is to go name your miracle, proclaim your miracle, and make it your own. God bless us all. Now, Go be the miracle God is calling us to be. Until we see each other again, this is Reverend Ken wishing you many blessings.
Let's be 